Hi, I'm Ray Ryan. I am with Square. Uh, I've been an Android developer there for a couple of years. And um, in the program, it said that I'll be talking to you about a new um, framework called Grenade. Um, that name came from a few months ago when a number of us were sitting around uh, bemoaning the fact that we had chosen to divide our app up into uh, fragments. Um, they were an improvement over what we were doing before there were fragments, but they come with a lot of problems of their own. We kind of wanted to toss a grenade in the whole mess and just start again. Um, we had some ideas about how we might approach that. We had a week called Hack Week during which I got to prototype some of those ideas and they seemed to work out pretty well. And this was at the same time that DevOps was calling for papers. And I thought a great way to make sure that I actually implemented something that I had to share with the world was to sign up to talk about that, uh, that framework that hadn't been written yet. Figured if it didn't work out, I could talk about what a terrible idea it was and how everybody should stay with fragments. But it did work out. It has a different name now. Um, and in fact, it has a partner called Flow. So this is what the talk would be called if I could have changed the name of the talk before you all got here. So let's talk about some of the, um, the, the, uh, the, the current state of things. Uh, what, what are the issues that we're dealing with when we try to uh, divide an app up into nice little manageable pieces? Um, if you're an Android developer, you have two options. You can make your app work with lots of activities, which is kind of what we all did when we first were young and naive and got started on the platform. Or you could use uh, what came along with Hollow and chop your app up into lots of fragments. And that's pretty much the state of things. Um, they both have issues with them. So if we just consider the activities world, um, remember the first thing you learned when you first started developing an Android app and you wanted to put in some rotation and you found out that the entire app was basically burned to the ground at that point and had to be started again, or at least as much of it as made no difference? Um, that's a nuisance to deal with. And you could try to just stay away from that problem by uh, not supporting configuration changes. You're still going to have an app that gets paused and resumed. Um, you could try to move state out of the activity and into the application itself. Um, you're kind of making a huge trade-off there. You've got no access to the lifecycle at all at that point uh, in the application. In particular, you don't have any access to the persistence bundle. Um, you can use the file system. You can create your own little hacks between the app and the activity, but it's a nuisance. So that puts you down into pretty much communicating between these activities using intents, which are a pretty um, unpleasant and cumbersome way to do RPC between little Java objects that are all sharing the same VM, and why should you have to deal with that? You've also uh, got the fact that every transition between activities is an ugly full screen experience, and of course you've got the general lifecycle experience of having some asynchronous work going on uh, that finishes when your activity isn't really there to hear back from you anymore. Um, none of it's a lot of fun. You move into fragments, and things are different than they used to be, but they're not really all that much better. You've kind of got a lot of the same problems. The configuration change still uh, defines everything about what you do. Um, you don't just have intents to deal with when communicating with things. You also have bundles, which are a requirement for dealing with friendly zero arcs, constructor fragments. Um, your transition options are um, not as full screen course as they used to be, but they're still kind of clumsy. Um, you should talk to me afterward about the hacks that we had to um, indulge in in the shipping version of the register to do a simple reveal transition using fragments. Um, you're also treated to a new kind of pain, which is the uh, illegal state exception thrown when you want to change the, the uh, fragment uh, transactions um, at the wrong time, which is pretty much any convenient time, it feels like, especially if you've decided to play with loaders as well. Um, and then finally, um, we find that we often bump into um, unexpected stale copies of our fragments um, showing up when we didn't really expect them to. Um, but it was particularly surprising to learn that when you do a new configuration, every instance of a fragment that you have dealt with, even those that you have replaced and thought were gone, um, will be reinstantiated and put through a portion of its life cycle for you just so that it can be told that it doesn't need to be displayed right now. Um, all in all, it seems a bit cumbersome and we thought that there must be a better way. Uh, so, talking around, we had four epiphanies. And I'll talk through those and eventually get to the actual software. Um, the basic lessons were the backstack is a pain, so why are you using it? Backstacks aren't hard. Um, living inside of something that is pretty much a, a gasoline soap bubble that will burst into flame or burst if you touch it is kind of painful, so don't do that. Oops. Um, Keep control over things by using dagger subgraphs, and 
don't be afraid to use views anymore. So I want to talk to these points in order then. Um, the first notion here, banishing the back stack. Um, Eric Burke and I uh, thought we were doing something pretty clever when we had this idea. Um, we pretty much uh, stopped any, any back stack involvement in the fragments that we were showing and created our own little switch statement to just uh, figure out what part of the screen we were on at the moment, decide what kind of a transition we wanted to use to leave that screen, and return an enum, enum value that we could use to conveniently choose which fragment to show next. And this actually worked staggeringly well. Um, it's not without its drawbacks. It's not something that I would call anything worth open sourcing, but it served our purposes. Um, it didn't really impress the rest of the team who found shortcomings with it and wanted to generalize this into something that we could actually use in more than one app at a time. And in particular, um, they weren't terribly impressed with the fact that if I, want to, if I had a, um, a state in my um, screen flow description that um, told me what type of an item I was going to be displaying, it didn't really give me any way to say which of the 5,000 types of that item I should be displaying. And we found ourselves with hacks to kind of sneak around through global shared objects, what was being edited by whom, and it uh, didn't work out very well. So the three gentlemen pictured here um, hacked together, and they have created a new uh, library called Flow, which will be open sourcing tonight or tomorrow. Um, which takes this notion of a uh, structure that's purely to describe um, how do you get from where to where to where in your app and um, makes it pretty convenient to work with. You wind up defining your app out of structures like this. Um, this is just an object. Um, it could have an annotation on it to convey a little bit of extra information, but it doesn't have to. And it has the information required to represent a state in my app. It doesn't have a view, it doesn't have a fragment, it doesn't have anything, it's a POJO. Um, but it does have uh, whatever parameters I need to hold on to to make sure that I can represent this state. It's kind of like a bookmark for your app, is the way to think of it. And Flow um, takes these objects that you define, um, has one interface that it offers, which is um, the has parent concept which gives it the ability to not only go from one screen to another, but also respond to a go up notion so that you can kind of define your topology. Um, and that's it. Um, it sounds simple. It is simple. It comes with utilities for um, extracting views out of these enums, but it's pure and it addresses the problem. Um, and it's working pretty well for us. So back to the list of epiphanies. We vanquish the back stack. Um, the next question is, how do we get control over um, this whole lifecycle thing? Um, what we wound up doing uh, in a lot of our apps was creating our own little internal plugin notion. So we've chopped our app up into fragments. Fragments are still um, kind of encumbered uh, with all the problems I mentioned before. Um, and in particular, they're subject to the lifecycle uh, configuration change nightmare. So um, it was nice that we created our little plugins which were agnostic, whether they were running in a fragment or in an activity, but they were still being torn up and uh, built up and torn down each time the user did anything with their phone. Um, it wasn't a huge improvement. Um, it got, the plugins got referred to as clever, which is always a bad sign. If you had to be clever, nobody really knows what you're doing. Um, and somebody very smart, Jesse Wilson, suggested that we should stop doing that and do something very simple instead, which was to just have one singleton global object for each of the type of screen fragment, whatever it is that we wanted to show, and let that do all of the work. It shouldn't really care whether you're um, uh, may have being torn down, whether you're paused, because it's just always there. When eventually a view, a, a fragment, an activity wakes up again and is ready for, to um, uh, talk to the world, the uh, controller can hear about it and let it know. So if your app consists of uh, a bunch of screens that are uh, you're flowing from state to state to state, then each of those can inject a uh, controller object that's going to actually have all of the brains of the operation. And when the configuration changes happen and the activity or fragment A gets thrown away and uh, A prime comes in to take its place, the uh, controllers stay consistent. Um, they weather the storm. And it turned out to be a very nice way to code. Um, one uh, complaint about this is the term controller. Um, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, and what happens if you've got the, the um, album fragment controller and the song track 
fragment controller, and you've got another kind of more general controller that needs to talk to both of those guys and coordinate between them. Isn't that a controller also? And where's the boundary? Um, so reaching back into a previous life, um, we just did off the term presenter uh, to talk about this particular breed of animal. So a presenter is a controller that has a one-to-one -one relationship with some kind of UI object. Um, it's kind of the monopolist on the services uh, of that view. If I want to, if I think that I need to interact um, with the album portion of my app somehow, what I really need to do is inject the album presenter, just like its view did, its fragment, its activity did, in order to run it in the first place. So um, that worked out pretty nicely. We've got some nice concepts to work with. Our code is a lot more testable now, and it's a lot easier to understand what it's all doing. Um, oh, sorry, in code, um, the way this type of thing is going to look is maybe something like this. Um, Taking a step back, I'm kind of taking for granted that you, like us, are uh, using dependency injection and are familiar with the concepts of dependency injection. Um, in particular, uh, we use the Dagger uh, dependency injection framework. It's like Juice, except streamlined for Android. Um, and the, um, the singleton uh, uh, presenters will probably be configured in code something like this. Um, Dagger. Um, takes for its direction a set of objects called modules, which are basically the factories that you will use for the stuff that parts of your app need to use. And so um, in your main uh, central um, dagger configuration for the app, you'll define a singleton presenter for the album portion of your app, a singleton presenter for the track portion of your app, and then the views that um, work with that kind of thing, an application, sorry, an activity, a fragment, whatever, um, they'll uh, annotate a field to have the presenter, their presenter injected. Uh, at on create time, they'll do something like the equivalent of this uh, bunch of casting and mess here in the middle. Probably you've got a static method defined to do that, or a super class of your activity is actually doing it for you quietly behind the scenes. I'll inject my presenter um, by that mess there, and I'll let the presenter know that I'm in activity and I'm ready to roll. Um, I'll let it know that I've resumed, and it can kind of keep track of things for me, stay be aware of what view is available to do what when. Um, so that's nice, it's a good model, but it leaves us with something that you've probably already noticed and are asking about, which as I step through my app, I'm, my uh, Android is tearing my fragments and my activities down for me because it's trying to protect the user's memory, which is a very honorable thing to do. Um, but I'm kind of littering the world with these uh, controllers that I'm not actually using half of the time. Um, and as I've taken um, more and more code out of my fragment and activity and put it into these controllers, that could become quite a lot of my app. Um, it's not a very polite way to act. Um, so that's where the third epiphany comes in, which is to divide our app into uh, subgraphs. Subgraphs are a feature of Dagger that allow you to take that module that we're looking at, which uh, defines all of our, um, uh, you know, does our factory duties for the application and it lets you divide them into individual separate modules that um, can be created into separate object graphs um, as needed. So we've chopped up our mass um, application module into a module that defines the needs of the album portion of the UI and a module that defines the needs of the song track portion of the UI. Um, Square is not getting into the song playing business. This is strictly an example. Um, and then somewhere in the machinery, deep in the bowels of your app, you're doing this kind of thing at, uh, at startup time. Um, you're creating uh, an application graph to do the injection for the bulk of your app. Um, at an appropriate time, you're creating a child graph to display just the objects that have something to do with the album or to do with the track. The actual code to get that done um, in sync with the life cycle in a convenient way it was tricky to figure out, and I'll go into more depth on that uh, in a minute. But overall, the concept's pretty simple, and it solves a lot of problems. Um, so, we don't have a backsec anymore. We are using singleton presenters effectively. Um, we have subgraphs working, so we actually don't run out of memory. And the final uh, lesson was um, coming to terms with fragments what's left of fragments, what's left of transactions, and that whole thing. Um, we basically realized that um, once we're doing all the, four, all the first three points here, 
there's not a whole lot left that fragments are doing for us. We don't really need the transaction manager because um, we not, uh, we're not trying to play, partake in the system back stack. We're afraid of it. Um, we don't really want fragments being recreated for us as, uh, as Android sees fit because we decided that we can be in charge of that too. And um, it, they're not really a help with animations at all. They're kind of a pain with that. So the question is, why are we using them? Um, the answer is don't. So if you take um, the uh, if you take the parts of your app that would have been divided into fragments and you just put them into plain old views, subclass of linear layout, subclass of frame layout, whatever is appropriate, and just put them where you want them, and they've injected their presenter so the presenter can know when they actually need to do their work. There's there's nothing left. You don't need any more framework on top of it than that. Um, so taking those last three lessons and piling them into a single convenient library, not a framework, a library. It's really tiny. It's about 16 classes overall, some of which you probably never even use. Uh, no abstract um, activity class, no abstract application class to uh, force you into line. You get the, uh, the new mortar framework. Um, going back to an iChart uh, code chart here again. Um, an app written using mortar is probably going to look something like this. So remember when I described um, flow, I said that you have a, um, a class that embodies the parameters to show a particular screen. Um, we'll go back to that and uh, we'll enhance it. Um, for one thing, we'll show you a, um, there's an annotation at the top here now called at screen, which um, is defining the layout or the view class that the screen shows. That's actually a trick of flows, not a trick of mortars. Um, we extend it further by having it declare the blueprint interface. Um, a mortar blueprint does two simple things. It gives uh, a name for the scope that can be used at uh, teardown, <laughs> setup and teardown time. Um, and it's responsible for returning the dagger module that actually has to do um, with this portion of your app. Um, so still inside uh, the same screen, um, it's uh, convenient, not required to define the actual dagger module there um, in place. So I've got kind of one-stop shopping for what's the, uh, the, d the definition of this portion of the app. Um, a cute trick that um, this module is doing is making it possible for the, uh, it, it's, uh, the classes that it managed to inject the appropriate um, track model object um, without having to know anything about um, how to actually query for the thing. It'll just be there to be pushed into the uh, code as soon as it's ready. Um, it's also a nice place to define the interface that your view objects might implement. It's not required that there be a view interface. There's no reason that I couldn't just uh, talk about my view directly, um, but it can make things readable if you uh, put it in there. It can make things more testable. Um, and then finally, um, we'll define the presenter object itself. Um, not usually with a capital C, but um, so in this case, we have the presenter for uh, the track portion of our UI. Um, we're declaring that it's a singleton. It'll be the only one of its kind in this particular um, dagger submodule. Um, and it's injecting that uh, track object uh, that we provided from the module. So the last bit of um, wiring to get um, mortar to go for this is in our onload method. Um, we're going to call get view. Um, the, the just comes to us. Uh, it's a method implemented in the presenter um, abstract superclass, and we'll tell the call the show track method that we defined for that view. Um, the view class itself, the track view, will inject its presenter like we talked about before. In its constructor, it will tell mortar to inject it. Um, uh, mortar's kind of one trick is that it um, defines the context that your view is running in, or your fragment, or your activity, and associates it with the particular object graph um, resources that you specified. So from the view's point of view, it's as simple as, someone out in heaven, please give me what it is I need to know. Um, and in the, um, at some point, the view has to let this presenter know that it's ready to play. Typically, we'll do that in the unattached to window method. Um, by calling, telling the presenter to take this view, which will have a nice side effect of making it drop reference to any previous view that it might have been holding on to, and you're ready to go. Um, one other thing that's worth mentioning about this is if you're using these tools, um, 
uh, and in particular using mortar to um, uh, manage these chunks of your app, um, the entire life cycle that a presenter needs to deal with to be useful is right here. Um, it'll be told to load when it's um, displaying for the first time or possibly doing a reload after a configuration change or something. It'll be given a chance to save its bundle when the activity that it's hosting it is being torn down. And it'll be told um, to destroy itself if it has tear down stuff that it needs to do um, at the end of its useful life cycle. Um, but the important thing to note here uh, is that this onload and onsave stuff is happening over and over again to the same single presenter instance. So if, I, uh, if this is the presenter for an activity or that lives anywhere under an activity, I'm flipping the phone around and activity instance after activity instance after activity instance are being spawned, the presenter isn't subject to all of that. Um, but once I decided that it's time to take that activity away or that view away and replace it with another one, um, I tell it to destroy, then I know that it's time for me to go away to do some cleanup. Um, I'm not constantly jumping from soap bubble to soap bubble. Um, it's all smooth sailing. Uh, so there is more I could talk about, but uh, the time is limited and I didn't make more slides. Um, in particular, um, I've only glossed over how one deals with um, loader types of um, services um, in, uh, in, in an app like this. Um, we had written some stuff to try to take that on. It was nasty to use in different ways than loaders, not particularly better. Um, recently, though, if you look at the uh, last bullet here on the various open source projects um, that uh, we espouse, uh, you'll see the one by Netflix, Rx Java. Um, we started using that for an increasing amount of anything resembling asynchronous behavior in our apps. Um, it's a wonderful tool for um, doing RPC. It's a, um, it looks like it'll be a great way to read things from the file system, um, possibly even get into some uh, user interactions with it. Um, and recently, uh, Retrofit, our um, uh, REST, um, uh, REST API integration service has started becoming knowledgeable of RxJava to make them more convenient to work together. Um, so that's what I have to present. Uh, are there questions that I can answer? Nothing? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.